Hi, everyone, and welcome again to another episode of my Gaudi Mitzbez 22 Podbean podcast and YouTube video. Today, repeat, a repeat guest. It is my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce once again His Excellency, the most wonderful Bishop of Lincoln, Nebraska, the Grand Poobah El Jefe of the Diocese of Lincoln, Nebraska, my hometown. So for that reason, Bishop Conley is near and dear to my heart. Uh, since I love my hometown, but also because uh, for those who don't remember the first episode, uh, Bishop Conley and I did attend seminary together back when we both had hair. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I was a lot thinner. Bishop Conley is still quite thin, but I unfortunately, if, if you ever saw me <laughs> below my shoulders, ever you see, you'd see uh, I have a nice pot belly. But anyway, yes, we went to minor seminary and major seminary together, St. Pius X in northern Kentucky, Diocese of Covington, and then Mount St. Mary's, the glorious Mount Emmitsburg, Maryland. And uh, a couple of our colleagues uh, from that era uh, are or were bishops, Bishop Paul Coakley of uh, Oklahoma City, or is that, is that an archbishop? archbishop? Archbishop, that's right. Archbishop Paul Coakley of Oklahoma City. Uh, also, uh, Paul and Jim are were priests of the Diocese of Wichita, and there were so many great Wichita guys who came out of the John Senior program, the Integrated Humanities program from Dr. John Senior at the University of Kansas, uh, which Bishop Conley attended. And you are a convert, so and I. But Paul Coakley is not. I think he's a cradle Catholic, right? Correct. Yeah, he uh, he grew up Catholic, and uh, we were roommates at the time in college. And in fact, we go back to um, we were on the same baseball team in the seventh grade. My dad was a coach, so we were you know we we're 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 a long time friends. But yeah, he was, uh, and he had an influence on my conversion too, already being Catholic. But we both went through the program. Yes. He, but he was already a Catholic. So uh, before we get into the main topic of today, and, and I'm going to spring this on you as a surprise, uh, the main topic today, folks, is liturgy. And, and uh, I've had numerous people email me and say, hey, had Bishop Conley come back on to discuss liturgy. Uh, and so here we are. But before we do that, this past year, you went on a pilgrimage uh, with Bishop Coakley and one other person who I can't remember. Talk to us a little bit. What was that pilgrimage and uh, what was it like? Sure. Yeah, that was called the uh, St. Cuthbert's Way. Uh, I've made the um, pilgrimage with the same group, uh, Archbishop Coakley, Bishop Jim Wall of the Diocese of uh, Gala. It. And this year we uh, we went along with uh, Father Father Burke Masters, who's a priest um, up in the Joliet, went with us this year. Uh, we've done the we've done the Camino in Santiago to, to Santiago de Compostela, St. James Way uh, in Spain. But this year we chose another one, um, which is in England. It's actually across uh, Scotland and England uh, called St. Cuthbert's Way to the burial place, which, which was the burial place of, of St. Cuthbert and St. Bede. And so it was an ancient medieval pilgrimage, uh, which started in the ancient Abbey of Melrose. And it's about, um, it was about 62 miles, about um, seven days to the island of Lindisfarne, the holy island of Lindisfarne, where there was oh, a, wow. where St. Aidan uh, was an abbot there, but then also St. Cuthbert was, and they were buried there for about 200 years from the end of the of the uh, seventh century to the end of the, of the ninth century. Then the Vikings came and they moved the bodies and it was all mayhem. And they ended up down in Durham, but there was this ancient pilgrimage where people would walk to the tombs of these two holy saints uh, and, uh, you know, in the tradition of pilgrimages and to pray at their at their tombs. And so st people still do it. There's still markings, but it goes through the highlands and all the different uh, ins and outs of England and Scotland. But uh, we did that this summer in August. So um, and, and anybody can do this, right? You don't yeah. have to be. OK, so oh, yeah. that's that's why I bring it up there for that reason, to encourage people to either do the Camino in Spain or the St. Cuthbert's way. Uh, but I also bring it up for another reason. And as we segue into our discussion of liturgy, it is a reminder of something that came up in my conversation with the Anglican convert Gavin Ashenden uh, last week. And uh, what Gavin pointed out, and as many others like Eamon Duffy and so forth have pointed out, was that uh, English Catholicism was indeed very vibrant uh, right up to and through the Reformation. And that the Anglican Reformation was sort of imposed on the people of 
Great Britain, imposed on the people of England. That this was not, according to the official propaganda, you know, a, a sort of revolt and uprising from the people, the Catholic people of England, to toss off the authority of the Pope. Uh, that simply was not true. And the point, Gavin Ashton's point, is that therefore the the downside of this not only that we lost that uh, the, the British Catholicism uh, to, to you know to the Anglicanism, but we lost the the liturgical riches mm. of of that tradition. So we're going to get into that later on in, in our conversation too, on liturgy, as we maybe talk a little bit about the Anglican ordinary liturgy and, and why, despite it's not very big in numbers, why it's important but before we get there. All right, let's, let's, let's begin uh, with, with, with liturgy. Uh, it seems to me, and then I'll, I'll just make this comment and then you can comment on it that we, we, for the past 30, 40 years, we've been talking about the new evangelization, and it begins with John Paul and moves forward. The new evangelization, the new evangelization. I've never quite been certain exactly what we mean by that, except that there's lots and lots of people leaving the church these days, and what we, we need to sort of reinvigorate our evangelizing efforts. But it does strike me, and you mentioned to me in a phone conversation yesterday, and so I want you to sort of riff on this and, and go on, that there, there can be no evan new evangelization absent a vibrant liturgical element in that. So maybe you could, let's begin by commenting on why you think that way, and then what really the ramifications of that are. Very good. That's a good place to start. And um, yeah, the new evangelization, I think the, the coining that phrase was uh, John Paul II. The idea being that uh, we're sort of in a post-Christian era, um, and yeah. that, you know, Christendom is no longer here anymore in the way it was, you know, going back in history. And so it's time for a new evangelization, almost like getting back to the apostolic times in a certain sense. Um, so kind of a representation of the gospel, the kerygma, uh, in this very secular kind of hostile environment, much like the early Christians. So we can't, remember, in other words, from maintenance to mission. You know, that we can't just maintain and depend upon our old institutions any, anymore. Oh, well, there's uh, a great book that mentions that from maintenance to mission. Yeah, yeah. What about the University of Mary? I, I can't think of the right, name. Right, yeah, yeah, from Christendom to Apostolic uh, Mission, I think it's right. It's but yeah, it's a great book. I rec highly recommend it. But it's, it's that, that's the idea of the new evangelization. So um, I've always believed, and I'm probably because my own conversion um, was very deeply rooted in the liturgical experience of the transcendent God in, in beauty, um, that unless there is an encounter, uh, a liturgical encounter with God in prayer and worship, no matter how great your apologetics are, you can have lots of Bible studies, you can present the faith in a very compelling and reasonable way, um, you're not going to really accomplish a, a, a true conversion or transformation unless people are brought to an encounter with Christ in the liturgy, in sacred worship. And, and you know, the reason for that, I think, is very clear, is that we, and it's a part of our DNA, that we're, we are created to worship God. You know, our hearts are restless until they rest in you, St. Augustine would say. That's right. And you go through the history of not just Christianity, not even Judaism but even the history of civilization, that man has always worshipped something, someone, because we need, to, we need to recognize that there's a power beyond us, you know, and that we have to give due worship and praise to that. The Israelites, you know, they were in captivity in Egypt. You know, it was a horrible situation. They were slaves, but the reason why they wanted to be free is so they could worship. You know, they wanted to be, you know, let my people go, so we could go out into the desert and worship God because they were under slavery. Um, so there's always been this desire to worship um, and to give thanks and to praise and adore God. And so we need, uh, you know, we need to realize that from the get-go that, 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 that the new evangelization really will not be successful, will not take root unless there is this liturgical dimension, unless people meet God in worship through prayer and the mystery of, of uh, the, the, for us, it would be the representation of the Paschal mystery in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass in the life of the liturgy. And, and there's that great axiom, you know, um, lex orande, lex credendi, that if people 
that the, 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 we we uh, we believe in what we worship, and so we 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 our belief, what it is we believe, um, is manifested in in how we worship and who we worship. And that there was, you know, liturgy, the Eucharist especially, and baptism, existed before the the New Testament came into being. You know, yeah. uh, that that in in point of fact, right that what later became the rule of faith, the, the creed, and so on, flowed out of, the, for example, Trinitarian doctrine. Uh, there probably wasn't a full-blown Trinitarian theology in 90 AD or 110 AD in the church, uh, but the need for a Trinitarian theology imposed itself upon the church precisely out of the baptismal formula, okay? the liturgy of baptism. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, you're, you're, you're renaming God at that point. That's kind of significant, right? It's not, I, I baptize you in the name of God or the Father or Yahweh. I'm, this is the significance of the commission that Christ gives to his, his apostles, you know, to, to baptize in the name of. We have to understand the full significance of the theology of the divine name within Judaism to understand that what Jesus was doing was renaming God in this tripartite formula. Now, he didn't give them a full-blown theology of the Trinity, but when he gave them a formula, and by golly, it imposed. So the, the Trinitarian doctrine, this is my point, flows out of the liturgical expression. Absolutely. You know, and the people... Uh, the very beginning, you know, the beginning of the church, the, uh, the apostles, um, you know, went out and they taught as Jesus taught and they came together as a community in the breaking of the bread. Yes. So that was, that was the liturgical celebration of the Paschal mystery. And now it wasn't, it doesn't, didn't look like the mass we have today, you know, in those first decades after the, uh, you know, the right. resurrection, um, but it was the the celebration together communally of what Jesus did the night of the Last Supper, the day before he redeemed us on the cross. Yeah, and I want to come back to the form of worship in the early church and, and talk a little bit about that. But before we do, because I think it's significant to the, the development of the liturgical movement in the 20th century. But we'll come back to that. I want to go back to something that you initially said, where you said, right, that Christendom is is dead as we once knew it. And this is an important thing that we need to consider in the new evangelization. And I want to really double down on that and point out that even in those parts of the world, the modern world, where Catholicism is growing, say Africa, which is quite often mentioned so frequently, even in Africa, there is no Christendom. Because almost every, I mean, there are millions of Catholics in Africa, but I, I could be wrong about this, but I don't think there's a single nation in Africa you could point to and say it's majority Catholic. Uh, there's a lot of Muslims in Africa, a lot of uh, Pentecostals in Africa, Anglicans in Africa, and so on. And even in Latin America, uh, you don't have Christendom anymore, where you still perhaps have nations where it's majority Catholic. So really, it's, it's so true. Christendom, as we knew it, that historical thing, that, that gets established after Constantine and maybe last up to, lasted up through maybe the 16th century to the Reformation. That's gone. That is really gone. And we need to consider that uh, very, very much. So, okay, Let, let's move on. Okay, you mentioned uh, that the Lex Orande, Lex Credende, and if you look at the early church, you said something very interesting. The mass there was not it did, probably didn't look uh, exactly like the mass that we have today. Okay, not exactly like. Uh, but you do read once in a while in various publications, very, 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 very traditional, where people have Jesus giving communion to the apostles while they're kneeling on the tongue, you know, and, and that it really was almost a Tridentine liturgy of some kind. Uh, and I don't mean to make fun of anybody. That's a, that's an extreme minority point of view. But there are some who think that 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 really, really, Jesus did a high liturgy at the Last Supper, um, and that the earliest, earliest Christian churches uh, were, it was very, very highfalutin liturgy, and you know, very, very similar to what later become. So, what what do you what exactly, based on your knowledge of liturgical movement and the history of liturgy, what did the, the Christian, the Catholic liturgy, the mass look like, say, 
from 50 AD through 150 AD, sort of up into past Irenaeus? Well, that's very good. I'm not a liturgical theologian, but I, you know, studied, read a little bit about, you know, the early church and the early liturgy. And one of the beautiful things that we have from the early church and the church fathers are actual texts, right? Um, which is really wonderful that, um, you know, wording of, of what was said, you know, by the priest um, and it traces it back to the very beginnings of the church. Um, but everything around those words, let's say everything around the words of consecration, um, which really the words of Jesus, the night of the Last Supper, um, grew organically. I mean, uh, there was probably, um, you know, very little uh, music, let's say, you know, um, and of course, there was there was very little, uh, there were no hymnals, you know, there were no missiles, <laughs> there were no, uh, you know, they didn't have worship aids you know, or anything like that. The um, St. Louis Jesuits had Oh, no, they weren't, they hadn't come into being yet. Um, and so, <laughs> and so the uh, people would gather and celebrate and there would be reverence, you know, there would be um, a sense, I think, of transcendence in the actual ceremony itself. The, there was a rite, the rites kind of grew up out of those words. Um, and as time went on, and I'm just kind of speculating um, in those first 150 years, I'm sure there was singing. You know, I'm sure that uh, like St. Augustine's great line, only the lover sings. And he talks right. a lot about the, important of mu the importance of music. And music was certainly part of the culture. And singing all the Psalms, perhaps? Psalms, yeah, because they inherited, I mean, the early Christians inherited the liturgical worship of you know, the, 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 the Israelites and, and, the, and the Jewish people. So I'm sure that a lot of, and in fact, even those who study Gregorian chant, which really came around, you know, let's say the time of St. Gregory, but even before that, um, it's just called Gregorian chant because he sort of, uh, you know, uh, highlighted yeah. it and wrote about it. But a lot of those chant tones and a lot of the music came from uh, the temple. Those were the, those were you know chant tones that were that were and I've I've heard presentations of comparing let's say early Christian Gregorian chant and uh, the chanting of the Psalms in the temple by the by the Israelites. I've read studies very similar, and since we're going to be talking about beauty and the liturgy and sort of the reform of the reform of the liturgy, I think it's very important to point out, to point this out. So I'm I'm really glad you brought this up that the Gregorian chant form is not some medieval concoction that then gets it goes all the way back to the tonality and the rhythm of, of, of the temple chants. And that makes a direct linkage between the Catholic liturgy and its Jewish roots in, in, in temple. And I think that's very important. I'd also point out there's a reason why chant is an almost universal prayer form in religions all over the world. Now, we don't want to get bogged down in discussion of comparative religions, but there's a reason for that. And I read once, I can't remember who said it. The reason for this is that chant is silence put to music. Mm -hmm. that, that si prayerful contemplative silence has an internal spiritual rhythm to it. And one of the things that chant has a kind of haunting silence to it, strangely enough, within its cadences. And, and so, yeah, I think that it's very important to point out what you just pointed out about the Jewish roots of chant. Right. There is. That's an interesting, it's almost counterintuitive to say there's a silence to this chant, which you're actually hearing something in your ears. But like, I, you know, I have, uh, I don't know if you know this, I have got Native American ancestry and, um, and uh, you know, a little bit. Uh, um, and actually enough to where it paid for my college education. There was a settlement uh, with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and our whole family got a settlement from, uh, I'm from the Wea Indian tribe, which is a small kind of subset of a larger um, Peoria nation. But um, but even in, in, in looking at my own ancestry and hearing the Native American chants, you know, and we've all heard them. Um, yeah. But there's something very... At least moving. I've heard this, the version in Spaghetti Westerns. Well, from... yeah, that's right. You know, and, and, and if you go to a, we would I would go with my family sometimes to a uh, powwow, you know, and you'd hear these chants. And, yeah, okay, uh, yeah. And, and, and they're, they're really, uh, they're, they're kind of similar to Gregorian chant. And, you know, so the indigenous people of our country, you know, that's that was their worship you know there was sort of a net and, and it was similar to the sounds of, of of gregorian chant or even hebrew chanting of the psalms so point being is that this form of uh worship is very much 
part of you know the human mm -hmm. history and that's what really more than almost anything that drew me to the anglican ordinary liturgy was I obviously studied Gregorian chant. Um, I was in Father Morgan Roth's Gregorian chant group <laughs> as an undergraduate. Yeah. Were you in that? I think yeah, we, you I was in that group yeah. too. Yeah, we, it was great. It was yeah, great. We, we had fun with that. And uh, But uh, what, one of the things that struck me was the Anglican plain chant in, in the ordinary liturgy. It's a, different, it's a different kind of chant than Gregorian chant. And yet it has its own real beauty. But what kind of drew me, we're talking about beauty here in the liturgy and the new evangelization and an experience of reverence. I was immediately drawn to the, uh, Carrie and I, my wife and I just went first, first time to it out of curiosity. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, what's this like? And we just fell in love with it, just mm -hmm. fell in love with it. And a lot of it, in my case, had to do with just the absolutely gorgeous nature of, of the Anglican chant, um, which has always appealed to me. And which kind of goes back to what you're saying about uh, the English Catholicism and the uh, British Catholicism, that it has its very ancient roots because, if you remember, uh, those who evangelate, evangelized the British Isles were monks. Um, they had St. Augustine coming from Rome, you know, in the fifth century. And then you had um, St. Um, Coleman and, and Columba coming from the Celtic nations, uh, especially Ireland. Uh, bringing a monastic, um, you know, kind of chant-based religion to a, a pagan Anglo-Saxon kind of world. And so there's the, the deeply, deep, I think, into in, in the English Catholicism is this, is this chant and this, yeah. uh, you know, which is maybe where the Anglican roots are too. Have you ever visited the little stone beehive huts out in Skellig Island in, uh, off the coast of uh, the Ring of Kerry? I have. In fact, that we convinced, I was with a friend of mine, my roommate from college, and we were in Ireland. Oh, gosh, this was probably about, um, oh, it's just probably I, after college, maybe 35 years ago. And we convinced yeah. a boatman in Dingle to take us out to the Skellig Michael. They hardly, nobody lives out there. We nope. waited two days for the seas to calm, and he took us out in a little boat. He said, you got one hour, and then we're out of here. So he let us off, and we just scoured that rock and went to the very top saw those beehive huts wondered how in the world somebody could live on this god forsaken rock you know seven miles off the coast of of ireland um which is by the way where they filmed uh the uh, star wars film uh the return of i forget which one it was but uh there's a scene on the on skellig michael in one of those movies um oh. but but it, yeah yeah it's it's remarkable that those monks lived out. I, I was once on vacation in Ireland and was staying in Dingle in the Ring of Kerry. And we were scheduled. We were had an appointment to go out to Skellig Michael to go see those beehive huts. Uh, but the morning that we were supposed to go, it was just gale force wind and it was unpassable and dangerous. So, so for those who don't know, the reason why I'm bringing this up is that it rep represents Irish monasticism and how important a monastic form of liturgical worship and prayer was to the entire, you know, what is now the British Isles and in Ireland, all right, and, and that, you know, I, I, I assume that the reason why the monks ended up out on the Skellig is about as far west as you can get while still being part of European civilization of some kind. You know, you go any further west and you're on your way to America. <laughs> right. right, absolutely. Yeah, that was in the western regions. Yeah. So anyway, enough of enough of that. But I just when you, we were talking about Irish and British Catholicism uh, being monastic, that 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 struck my mind. But it really is a, a vivid image of how important that form of worship uh, was. So that leads me then to um, you, we, we spoke yesterday on the phone and we, we talked about uh, that we wanted to discuss. And I think this is a natural point to do so. The fact that uh, the reform of the liturgy that we saw after Vatican II, we can talk about whether or not it followed Vatican II or not, but that, that didn't just come out of nowhere. That prior to Vatican II, there was a rich, rich theological development in the area of liturgic, liturgy. It was called the liturgical movement, mm -hmm. uh, and it was Dom Odo Casal, uh, Louis Bouillet, Guardini, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now. I'm sure yeah, you I, would, I would even go far, so far as back to Dom Garanger 
Dom Prosper yes. Pouget, the abbot of Salem, who in the middle of the 19th century recovered Gregorian chant and kind of had his own liturgical reform and wrote that 15 volume work, the liturgical year, kind of recover, you know, what had been lost, you know, for at least 300 years. Um, yeah. And it was at the you know be beginning or middle and towards the end of the, the 1800s. And it was carried on into St. Pius X, who had, had his own liturgical reforms. And then throughout the, the, the 20th century, Pius XII had his Mediator Dei, which was a huge liturgical reform. But all oh, these that's what it was. I told I said yesterday on the phone to you, Mr. Corpus. No, yeah, no it was made. Yeah. It was Mediator Dei. Yeah. Yeah. In the 50s or yeah. in, the, yeah, in the 50s, in the 50s. Oh, no, yeah. I think it was 1947, 1947, I think it was 1947. Mystici Corpus came out in the 50s. I do okay, but, but I think Mediator Day. But was... Mediator Day came out in, 19, I, gosh, I don't want to be wrong, but I think you're right. I think it's 1947. It all, yeah. it all runs together. All I remember is reading all these encyclicals in yeah. schools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but your, point, your point is well made, is that there was this um, at least 100 years of, of really serious scholarship uh, of liturgical reform, you know, was going on um, by these great lights, you know, and of course, Pope Benedict XVI really picked up on Guardini and wrote that wonderful book, uh, uh, Spirit of Liturgy. Spirit of Liturgy. Yes. And uh, Louis Bouillet, who was a priest of the oratory, a convert, I believe he was a Lutheran uh, and, and converted uh, was also a very, very big proponent of the liturgical movement and so on. And we'll remember get, we'll Louis talk... Bouillet came to the Mount? Yes, absolutely. Although I don't believe, was I there when he when he came to the I, Mount? I think you were. I think he came and just, uh, he, I don't know, he was a friend of, of Father Quinn. Yeah, our, 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 <laughs> our liturgy, liturgist. our <laughs> liturgist of happy memory, whose teaching style has a lot, had a lot to be, consisted of, passing out to us endless Xerox copies of articles that he had just read and found interesting. Yes. And then spending an hour telling stories that had no bearing on liturgy. So we want to get into this a bit too, about liturgical formation in seminaries, because you and I got none of, we got right. no, no. I remember I was trying to, you know, people know that I'm a laicized deacon. So I was just a few months away from ordination to the priesthood. And I remember thinking to myself, before, I mean, I was already thinking about leaving, obviously, but I remember thinking, well, you know, it's a few months, I'm going to be saying mass. So maybe I ought to open up a sacramentary and figure out how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> because literally, we, we, we had yeah, we, nothing. We had we nothing. Had, we were at one of the better seminaries in the country. Yeah. Yeah, we were. We were. And that's, once again, a point down the road. But I want to get back. I'm getting, I keep getting off track. But uh, what, what would you say then is, are some of the key insights of the liturgical movement uh, that took place before the council, lean up the council. I, I would assume one of the key ideas is the notion of the active participation of the laity. So maybe you could comment on that. Yeah, I think that's probably the one, you know, if you want to, if you say, okay, what was, what was the main driving force? That was probably the, the leading driving force is that, you know, to, 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 to somehow engage the faithful and the pews in the liturgical um celebration you know to and that's not just singing you know but that is to because we know that active participation doesn't mean just singing but that's part of it and so i think that was one of the things that um that the liturgical reformers going back before the council were trying to do trying to engender trying to inspire somehow that we're all celebrating together with the priest at the head uh, offering this praise and worship to God, um, the, the Paschal mystery, the holy sacrifice of the mass, but that everybody had, that everybody was part of this liturgical celebration. How do you do that? Well, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's the big challenge. You that's know? the key. And I think prior to the council, um, you know, and again, we weren't, I don't know anything about it. You just hear stories about what it was like before second Vatican council. So you can only go by what you hear and you hear all kinds of things. Um, yeah. But I think that probably is what is true is that the liturgical uh, celebration, the life of, you might say, the action of the, was really all done by the priest, and 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 the lay faithful were were just, you know, they 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 were not in, they were they were engaged mystically. I think I can't, we can't say that that they, you know, the, the, I think that depending on how 
the person was, they, they understood what was going on and they participated in a very mysterious kind of mystical way. Um, but there was, but it was, but it was, everything was kind of done by the priests in the sanctuary. And it was uh, very much um, kind of removed, you might say, from the people themselves. It was all very silent. It was all silent, you know, and which is great. Silence is great. Silence is golden. Um, so we can't discount that because I think we have too much noise now. We have we, we got we, we've swung to the other oh, to the yeah. other extreme, and silence definitely is contemplative. But going back to then to the point of active participation, the downside to so much silence from the priest is that you know the mind wanders. Yeah. <laughs> you know the the average right. layperson is sitting out there going, well, where the heck are we in in the liturgy? Right, and then we had your nose in the missal and you, or you're praying the rosary, following along, you know. And that's not to say that that person wasn't engaged. You know, they could have been. But the but the downside is that most people, they say, were not. You know, they were just either praying the rosary or, you know, getting, you know, just, just patiently right. going through uh, what was well, going on. I would submit to you as Exhibit A that the assertion that they were not really all that actively engaged in liturgy, the evidence in Exhibit A is the rapidity with which the entirety of that house of cards collapsed immediately after the council. Something has to account for why Catholic culture disintegrated overnight and why it was that so many lay people in the church, say 1969, 1970, happily embraced the Novus Ordo, happily threw off the Latin mass. I mean, it wasn't like there were these massive waves of protest against give us back our Latin mass. People were thrilled that mass was now in the vernacular and said out loud and blah, blah, blah. Now, that's not to say they were right to be thrilled. I'm simply pointing, I'm making your point again, that there are those who say there was no active participation really on, on the parts of the faithful. So anyway, go, keep going. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. I mean, and just, just the language itself, you know, obviously the, the, the council fathers did not intend Latin to disappear. Right. But it, but it did, unfortunately. Um, and I and I think that's we need to recover Latin. That's that's I want to say that first. Um, but the thing was, nobody at that point in time in culture, you know, very, very few people. We were we we had declined in, as a civilization so that even the learned class didn't know Latin. And and then you even had the priests who had struggled with Latin. So you had the priest who's supposed to be the master of Latin celebrating. And he was just kind of wrapping through the mass. You know, not really, I mean, maybe he knew what he was saying, but it, you know, it wasn't really, he wasn't engaged in the Latin. And then the people, fewer and fewer of the people understood Latin. And so once it was, it was the, the vernacular was brought in. And then that was, I think, one of the reasons why people embraced it. So, oh, I understand what's going on. I can understand these words. Yeah. You know? um, and, and, and so that was immediately embraced because now, especially with the scriptures, you know, when, when the scriptures were, were, were then proclaimed in the language of the vernacular, in the, in the language of the people, people then all of a sudden heard the word of God preached in the language they understood. Um, and so that was immediately embraced. Yeah. And, and I think that that's probably why, even though the Council Fathers did not envision Latin going away, uh, they did say, it, I, I'm paraphrasing, under for certain pastoral exigent circumstances uses of the vernacular might be allowed here and there right. yeah, yeah and so that was that was the loophole through which boom yeah. the, you know you get all these vernacular liturgies all over the world we'll come back and talk about that but i want to go back to active participation and the liturgical movement i kind of want to stay focused uh one could make the argument that one does not have to be outwardly singing or outwardly listening to the vernacular Eucharistic prayers and so on. One does not have to be engaged in dialogical responses, you know, and with your spirit and all that kind of thing in order to be actively engaged, right? Correct. But I would argue, and then I'll get your comment on this, that it, it does help. I and mean, we are incarnational beings, right? And thus kinetic movement and actual verbalization of words I think does help us to engage the liturgy in a way that a more passive, just sitting in the pews, trying to follow along in a missile does. Do you agree or disagree with that? Or I agree. I think that there, we, because we're incarnational beings and because we have voices and we have eyes, that um, 
some sort of engagement um, with what is going on uh, in the, the body of the mass, uh, uh, you know, in addition to the singing, um, is necessary or is is very helpful um, in a human way of of drawing us into what what the the, the priest is doing. And so I, I think that was one of the things, like we were talking about what 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 was the kind of motive behind the changes. That was an attempt, and that was that was something that goes back even before the council is how do we how do we do that in a way that still honors the transcendence and the, the reverence and the otherworldliness of the liturgical action and getting the people involved. Yes. And were there were there already people in the church, say in, in the 50s, let's say, who were already running ahead of the church, so to speak, by implementing certain reforms within the liturgy uh, before the council? It, but, but, what comes to mind, the reason I'm, I just read the other day, there was a, a statement put out by Pius XII, I believe it was like 1955 or 56, where he condemned the use of the vernacular in the liturgy by those who are doing so without, without explicit ecclesial approval. And so we have this image of the preconciliar church as just this monolithic edifice of completely obedient Catholics. And yet that statement from Pius XII makes no sense unless there were already people out there doing a little liturgical experimenting on their own. Yeah, I'm sure that's probably true. I mean, it makes sense that it would be. Um, I don't know. I've never read much about it, but I'm sure that there were people who were already trying to move in this direction before, you know, ahead of ahead of the church, which is not I'm sure. The Germans right. probably were. Come on, it was probably the Germans, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, <laughs> or they, or know, the French. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, people were there. Was always innovators who were kind of taking. Yeah. Things, trying to get ahead of the game. Okay, so, so we have this liturgical movement, and they're trying to retrieve elements then of the ancient liturgy. I. Th it, it, some people accuse the, the, the traditionalists, let's say, who simply believe we need to stick with the Tridentine liturgy. And I don't I don't want to, you know, caricature them I and mean, that they have the right to their opinions. And I, and I love the old liturgy, so I'm not here to disparage them. But they're oftentimes their criticism of the liturgical movement is that it's an attempt at repristinating some kind of ancient past liturgy in a kind of. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Primitivism. That's the word. Yeah. A primitivism yeah. that doesn't take into account the fact that the liturgy developed organically over many centuries under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we need to pay attention to the organic development of that liturgy and not try to destroy the patrimony of the church through some sort of reconstructed third century liturgy. What do you, what do you, what do you make of that? I think that's a valid criticism, and I think Pope Benedict even talked about that. You know, that yes. you can't you can't go back and sort of um, you know recreate the early church. You know, um, there has to be development, and this development is legitimate. You know, the the development of the mass through the ages, um, you know, going through you know the early Middle Ages, the High Middle Ages, and into you know Renaissance and all those things. Um, those were all very valid. Um, if we believe that there is such a thing, and of course, St. John Henry Cardinal Newman wrote a whole essay on development of Christian doctrine. The doctrine is not stagnant and, and, and worship is not stagnant. You know, it develops and it, and it grows. Yeah. Now, in that growth, you know, and this is, gets back again to maybe what second motivation was uh, in addition to active participation. Simplification. Simplification, exactly. This was what this is what, and this is where I think, and I'll be kind of critical, uh, carefully critical on this. You, know, I think we went too far simplifying. In other words, the idea that there were yeah. all these 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 things accrued, the, the, these things kind of were added on to the liturgy, you know, through the centuries, and there was you know um, all kinds of things added on and, and built, and so there was this whole kind of very complicated in a certain sense, like uh, one of my professors used to say, you have to, to understand the rubrics of the old mass, you need a PhD in astrophysics because, and you know, and, 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 and again, that I was John to, senior, right? That was John senior. My godfather. He said that who was, who loved the Latin mass, but he was, he kind of laughed about that. And it's true. I love the old liturgy. In fact, I celebrated it this morning because in preparation for this podcast, I uh, offered mass because I had a private mass this morning. So I offered a mass yeah. 
in the, oh, I uh, love I love the old liturgy. I, I, it's gorgeous. Missile. And it's interesting, too. I, just, I was going to point this out. You know, with the, today is the Feast of St. Blaise. So in the old mass, on the old calendar, Feast of St. Blaise. But also it's the feast. It's a Saturday. So in the old liturgy, you know, they combined the two. So basically, I celebrated the mass of Our Lady, white vestments. But then the secondary um, commemoration was St. Blaise. So I had a chance then to say the, the propers of St. Blaise after. So it repeated it. So that was one of the things they cut out because, you know, you don't want to keep adding different saints onto this mass. It makes it longer. Well, it's just a few seconds more, but, you know, but it, it, it had a beauty about it that, you know, that it included a kind of an expansive thing. So back to simplification, you know, the repetitions, you know, I think there are like 27 signs of the cross. I did them this morning and, you know, a number of genuflections, many, many more genuflections than it's in the new mass. And so I mean, you're always genuflecting and moving and stuff like that. So I think, um, you know, which is beautiful. It's kind of a dance, you know, and once you get like, I, I, it's, it's very familiar to me now and I don't even have to think about it, you know, about the different actions and gestures and signs of the old mass. Um, but there's so many of them you know, that you, you could see where it becomes, you, you could just sort of just kind of blindly just go through it, you know, and you're just, you know, not even. But even there, I mean, uh, we, we've got nothing over the Eastern Orthodox when it comes to repetition. Oh, yeah, exactly. I once attended, oh God, like 40 years ago now, Russian Orthodox baptism in the midst of a liturgy in, in Washington, D.C. And it went on for three hours and it was like, holy things to the holy. Blah, 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 blah. It's like, yeah. holy how many times are we going to chant the same thing? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah So, yeah. but yeah. So in other words, maybe there was a theological point too, though, to the repetitions. Maybe right. it wasn't just one accretion after another accretion after another accretion that finally led to this unwieldy thing with 27 signs of the cross. Maybe there was a theological reason behind all that. And I'm, uh, after we were at our conversation yesterday and you were talking about simplification and John Senior's quote about a PhD in astrophysics or whatever to figure it out. Maybe the purpose behind a kind of thick rubricism is precisely to keep the priest's creative personality out of the liturgy. That in other words, the priest is tied to an intricate set of rubrics that form a kind of dance into which he must enter. And there isn't a lot of Father Skippy does his thing. Right. Absolutely. No, I think you hit you hit hit it on the nail on the head there, because I think and I and you talk when you talk to priests, especially my younger priests who, you know, will learn the old mass and they tell me and I know it's true because I experienced this morning. You know, it ties you to that ritual. I mean, everything is scripted, every gesture, every yeah. movement every and you got to be on top of it you know you got to get to the next one to the next one and pretty soon the mass is over because you've you you there's no time for you to kind of you know take a break or you know hey how's it how's everybody doing out there right now you know it's, it's you're 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 focused on the whole thing so it's very engaging engages all the senses the body you're genuflecting you're making signs of the cross you know you're really you're tied to the rubrics one after the other after the other after the other and so in that sense, you're absolutely right. You're in it. You know, you're in the moment there. And, you know, I suppose then going back to what we said before, are the people in that moment, you know, uh, those who are following right. what the priest is doing and understanding and seeing what he's doing, they probably are, but they're sort of back here and they're not really knowing yeah. or seeing what the priest is doing. So, so for the priest, from the point of view of the celebrant, it is certainly much more incarnational and engaging in every sense of the word when the priest is celebrating the mass. Yeah. I just know from attending the Anglican ordinary liturgy, just a, our solemn Sunday mass, 10 AM at our parish lasts an hour and a half almost. And it, it's because there, it, it, I wouldn't say it's because of repetition, but there is, there's an ornateness to it, a thickness to it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that the Novus Ordo lacks. And, and so, for example, if there's a short form or an, a long form of the gospel to read that we read the long form. Right? <laughs> OK, but uh, let's let's. I, OK, so we're, what I'm trying to do here, in case my read, listeners don't know, I'm trying to establish criteria for what 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 should guide us in any reform of the reform of the liturgy. So what brought us to the reform of the liturgy? What were the strengths and weaknesses of the old liturgy? 
And so, you know, there was a need for some simplification. There was a need for more uh, active participation. Uh, but I want to come back to this idea that perhaps the liturgical movement was guilty of a certain amount of primitivism. In mm. particular, I want to mention, and this goes to the reform of the reform. I personally, it's just me. I don't want to project this onto you. So my listeners know, but not all my opinions are necessarily those of Bishop Conley. I wish the church would expunge Eucharistic prayer too immediately from the sacramentary, because it got into the sac. The idea was that it's rooted in the liturgy of Hippolytus, right? And which is third century. And so, wow, you get back to this, this ancient, pure Christian form. And yet in reality, as Louis Boyer points out, it was not, we don't have the full liturgy of Hippolytus. What we have are certain prayers from Hippolytus and so forth. And so what we might have are, in fact, very, very, very condensed versions of a much more ornate liturgy and a set of prayers that Hippolytus made. So in other words, there was, you. so supposedly Eucharistic prayer too was based on this liturgy of Hippolytus. The reality is, is that Eucharistic prayer too was written in a two-hour time span by Louis Bouillet and a confrere at a cafe in Trastevere near the Vatican, because he got word at the last second that the Holy Father wanted this new Eucharistic prayer, and he was the, the, the appointment was for just a few hours later. Now, Bouillet doesn't say this in order to, you know, cast doubt on the liturgical reform or anything. He just put this is actually how we got Eucharistic prayer too. Uh, so, my point would be this. I think that it has taken over the Catholic liturgy in so many ways because it's short. And I think a lot of priests use it because it's short. But in my mind, what part of the reform of the reform would be just a return to the old Roman canon, Eucharistic prayer one, as, as this, that's not to say we can't have other Eucharistic prayers, but that the Roman canon would be the standard Eucharistic prayer. What do you think of all that? I, I, I agree with you. I, I mean, I agree with you, um, you know, in the sense that I think that what, and again, I, I heard this, I know the story, it's probably true about the, the, the prayer being written out on the back of a napkin. Well, Bouillet he, says, well, it's not, he doesn't say napkin. He just says it's yeah. in his memoirs. He says in a, in a cafe, yeah. on the terrace of a cafe in Trastevere. Go ahead. No, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that's probably true. And I think that that, resulted in this one, this this drive for simplification, shorten it, shorten it, shorten it. And then this also idea, well, this is we're, this is really an ancient, ancient form. So we're getting back to the kernel, you know, the, the from Hippolytus. Yeah. We're getting back to the very essence of it, stripped down and right to the heart of it. Um, and then this rush to 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 have something. Um, and I think that um you're right. I, I you know um, is it valid? Absolutely, the second Eucharistic prayer. Um, but as one of my friends said, valid, but barely. <laughs> in, the sense, in the sense that it, it is stripped down to its essence. And, you know, human nature being what it is, a priest is in a rush, whatever, he's going to go right to Eucharistic prayer too, you know, and people want to get in and get out, you know. And so the, 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 the thing is, okay, I mean, I'm probably, there's probably some priests that that's, that's their go to, you know. Um, I, I, in good conscience, I can't say the Eucharist, second Eucharistic prayer on a Sunday. It's not supposed to be said on a Sunday. I use the Roman canon every Sunday mass. Um, that should be mandated, I think. I, I, in fact, I would go out, I, I'd be so bold as to say, why couldn't we just mandate that every Sunday liturgy, you know, Eucharistic prayer too is barred and that we do the Roman canon, the first Eucharistic prayer, you know, universally. Through yes. Um, why why is this what what's in the roman canon your excellency well uh, in the roman canon so go ahead yeah you know, if you compare let's say the roman canon to the to to well you know in the in the 62 missal it's basically the same you know there's no change um now there's a little bit of change but there's pretty much this whole thing in the, the tridentine the, the latin mass and roman and eucharistic prayer one are all are the same thing because it's got the fullness of the faith. I think that's what it is. It invokes yeah. the saints both before and after the consecration. It's got the epiclesis in extended form. It's got, um, you know, it's it's it's, a, it's the- Prayers for the dead and the sick. Prayers for the dead, for the sick. It, it invokes everything. Yes, it's longer. It's the longest, but it's got everything there. And 
I think this is where we get back to the liturgical reform, because I don't think the liturgical reformers ever thought about or dis thought that we, we would ever do away with the Roman canon. It's the fruit of 2000 years of development, you know, because if you look at and there's been doctor dissertations done on the Roman canon going back into the Middle Ages and every kind of addition or accretion, if you want to call it, uh, to the Roman canon was a was a fruit of, of a development. And it was sort of canonized, if you will, at the Council of Trent. Um, but it still has that fullness and it, ha it enjoys that richness of, of development. So why shorten that? Why strip that down? Okay, maybe we can, you can find other places to simplify. But, you know, don't simplify yes. in this part of the Mass because this is the heart. This of is the heart of it. You know, shorten something else for kind of love. I would also say that the Roman canon emphasizes in a way that that Eucharistic prayer too doesn't the sacrificial element of the mass. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The language, the sacrificial language, the oblation um, of the body and blood of Christ. Um, yeah, the, the the whole sacrificial the, dimension, the role of the Virgin Mary, everything. I mean, like it's 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 a little credo all wrapped up into one there. Uh, I would also like to bring up the issue of uh, since we're talking about reform of the reform, we just mentioned one a re-emphasis on the Roman canon, uh, but then uh, ad orientum. I know you you uh, say mass when, whenever you can, ad orientum. Right. In fact, I have it, um, <laughs> did a, an extensive catechesis back in 2014, um, and I did, I, I celebrated ad orientum and, and asked everyone, and all the priests to celebrate ad orientum during Advent. I think it was 2014. Um, and then I just kind of left it up to them if permission to do it um, as long as they, you know, had proper catechesis with the people. Um, not, not obviously not everybody. In fact, I'd say majority went back, you know, and didn't. And some, some still do it. But I, I committed myself to celebrating ad orientum at our cathedral, which I'm right next door to right now, uh, at my seminary as as an example and a, and, and a modeling for our seminarians uh, at Newman Center for our young people uh, at the University of Nebraska and at the retreat center. So whenever I go to any of those four places, it's always ad orientum, and I've been doing that for 10 years now. And so people are used to it. I mean, there's there's no, no everybody accepts it. There's no pushback on it. Now, when I go out for confirmations, it's totally what they're used to. I, you know, and I'd say most of it is versus populum. You know, I, I you know, I, yeah. just, I, I don't want to upset the people or anything like that. Or, but you know, I think that that's very important for a lot of reasons. One. Probably the primary reason is, and, and this is this easiest way to kind of explain it to people, is that we're all together, right, offering the sacrifice to God. So let's face together. Let's let, 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 let's 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 stand before God together. I'm with you in solidarity. I'm leading you, but we're all facing God together. And then like uh, I think it was Father Mike Schmidt said, if I was leading people up a mountain, I wouldn't be walking backwards up the mountain leading them up. Or if I was driving a bus, I wouldn't be facing the people if I was. It's <laughs> a good point. So it's a good point. I mean, it, again, it's it's, it's less the, clericalistic to face the face right. away. Yeah. And then and, and, and the other aspect of, of uh, the other thing is it, and it's it's uncomfortable if you're not used to it as a priest, because you're used to kind of being up there looking at the people. But, you know, when you are standing uh, there, um, you know, with the people facing the, the altar, there is a solidarity that you're representing the people yeah. and you're less distracted as a priest. You're focused on God. You're focused on the crucifix. You're focused on offering worship to God. And the interesting thing is, even when I celebrate Ad Orientum here at the cathedral, I'm facing the people. You know, let's say it's an hour, hour long mass. I'm facing, yes, the, yes. I'm facing the people more than I'm not. There's more minutes of me facing the people, proclaiming the gospel, preaching, you know, everything about, you know, the opening right, the closing right. The only time I'm not is when I walk over to the altar and, and offering the sacrifice. I was just, I'm so glad you brought that up. I was just going to point this out that in the Anglican ordinary liturgy, the priest faces away from the people quite often. The Eucharistic liturgy, the Sanctus, I mean, the Eucharistic prayer, the Sanctus and, and various other prayers at the foot of the altar. But there are also various moments, even when he's facing away from us, where for certain prayers, he turns back towards the people. 
Right. Okay. And solicits from us a response of something. Then, of course, reading the gospel. Oh, and this is another thing. In the Anglican Ordinary Liturgy, there's a gospel procession to the down the center aisle into the middle of the congregation with an altar boy or a deacon holding the gospel book with incense that the priest is then reading. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I, I think that's an excellent tradition, too, of, of reading the gospel from down in the congregation like that. But the point is, there are many, many instances in which, even though the worship is ad orientum, the priest is facing the people. Also, it, it, it highlights this dialogical thing. So, you, you know, you're, you're addressing prayers that are, that are proper to God, to God, and you're facing, you know, God. In the sense, you're facing East, if it's not the liturgical East, you're facing the crucifix, you're facing with the people. But then when you're talking to the people, you turn around to the people and you face them. You read the scriptures to them. You preach to them. You say, the Lord be with you, you know, and there's this, this yes. is clear dialogue. It's not all facing the people. It's back and forth, back and forth. Yes. And I also want to emphasize that on Orientum, I wrote an article in Catholic World Report about this. And I was and what prompted me to write the article was I had read something from Joseph Ratzinger in which Ratzinger was talking about the significance of Ad Orientum liturgy, which he clearly prefers. But he pointed out something. He goes, it's got nothing to do with facing the tabernacle. It's got to do with facing the risen Christ, mm-hmm. the crucified and risen Christ. So there'll be a cross there and you're facing east because the rising sun, it represents the resurrection. So an odd orientum posture is a posture t- through the crucifix towards the resurrection. Even if the tabernacle, I, I believe the tabernacle should be there. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but that you're not you're not facing away from the people so you can be chatting at the tabernacle. Right, right. That's yeah, exactly. Because like look at St. Peter's Basilica, you know, the tabernacle yeah. is um, is not even in the sanctuary. Um, and so, um, you know, it's the idea that you're, you know, standing with the people facing liturgical Easter, the resurrection, you know, yeah. anticipating yes. the, 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 the really anticipating the second coming of the Lord. Yes, it's exactly right. It has this eschatological element, too which is really key and important. And I, before we move on, one last thing about simplification and so forth. What just popped into my brain is, you know, last summer I was in Rome and uh, with, we were with a pilgrimage with the ordinariate and we visited St. John Lateran, which of course was the original cathedral and still is the official cathedral of the Pope, Basilica of the Pope in Rome. The, if you've ever been there, I'm sure you have. You, you were the work for the you work for the congregation of bishops for how many years? Uh, ten, ten years. Yeah, ten, ten years. Yeah, I should tell that to my listeners here, that uh, you are you are a veteran of the Roman Curia. But anyway, <laughs> the uh, the baptistry outside of La- the Lateran, the the old baptistry, the round building. You know, it's huge. It's like yeah. a swimming pool almost, but filled with these gorgeous mosaics and all this. Inter- so it's you you would know better than I because I can't remember now when that baptistry was built. And if that was built in a supposedly simplistic era of the church, boy, I would love to have such simplicity. Well, I think that baptistry predates the actual basilica itself. Um, I think so. Okay. And, and, yeah. I, and I don't know, I don't know when it was, was built, but yeah, it, it, and it was, again, you know, that's the baptism of the church. I mean, that was sort of the, the, the baptismal church of the, of the, of the Catholic church, you know, and, and, and named after St. John. Absolutely. And uh, I'm assuming that most baptistries were not quite so ornate as the sort of mother church of Catholicism there in, in Rome. Uh, But nevertheless, that I was very, very, taken aback by the sheer beauty of it okay right. well we're, we're running up on oh god we i i didn't think that we would fill an hour so quickly but let's let's do you have time to hang around for another 10 or 15 minutes absolutely if our listeners can bear with us yeah we can bring oh yeah well often sometimes my podcasts go like an hour and a half hour and 15 okay good. I, I would like to talk uh then okay so talk about the reform of the reform of the novus ordo before we do and once again i don't want to dominate the conversation uh, but I think it's kind of common knowledge amongst people that care about liturgy, including Joseph Ratzinger and including Louis Bouillet in his memoirs, that the Novus Ordo in many ways was not really what the Council Fathers envisioned. And it seems to have been kind of rushed, rushed in to the church uh, through some Bouillet complaints bitterly about 
how it was rush, rush, rush. And then we just need to get something out, get something out. So here it is. And Bouye had a conversation with Paul the sixth and, and said, are you happy with this? And Paul the sixth said, no, but it's what we have. And then they had a conversation where Paul the sixth said, I thought you, the whole liturgical committee was all on board with this stuff. And Bouye said, well, we were told that you were all on board with this stuff. So there, there were some people, some nefarious agents let's say, involved in, in, and I don't mean that, that they were demonic or diabolic. I'm just saying they were people who had a vision of liturgical form like Bugnini uh, that then sort of were a bit deceptive, playing both ends against the middle in order to get what they wanted. So I'm not saying this at all to disparage the Novus Ordo. I, I think it's a perfectly fine liturgy. It's got all the elements of a mass and so forth. Nevertheless, it has deficiencies. This is my point. So what do you see then as, as I, I would, and I'll just say this, I, I would like to see instituted in the Novus Ordo that the Roman canon is the preferred Eucharistic prayer. I would like to see ad orientum emphasized. I would like to see the reinstitution of altar rails with communion received while kneeling on the tongue. I would like to see a reintroduction of chant uh, as the preferred musical form uh, at the liturgy. Um, and that's just kind of for starters. So what, what is your opinion? Where's, where should the reform of the reform go? I'm going to stop talking now. I always get these complaints from viewers. Stop talking, chat. Let your guests speak. <laughs> no, I, no I, I, I would have to say uh, on this, on what you've just said, I, I agree with everything you said. I think that that would do, that would be huge uh, in the reform, I think. And, and, and when you think about it, it's not a it's not that radical because it's already being yeah. done to a little, for example, you say communion rails. We now have a policy in our diocese that every new church has to have a communion rail. Ooh. And we just, we just, and, and, and if you're renovating a church, you got to put a communion rail. In. And um, we discovered, you know, it's interesting. We just built this beautiful Newman center. You've visited our Newman center. Oh, and I want to stop and give a plug to my viewers. If you're ever driving through Lincoln, Nebraska, stop in and see the church at the Newman center. Go ahead. It's, it's, it's stunning. And uh, uh, we, uh, Cornerstone was in 2015. And uh, Father Mattia, who was uh, oversaw the whole uh, project uh, before we built it, he canvassed the students. What do you want? You know, wh what would you like to have as far as a, a church place to worship? And one of the top priorities of these college kids were, it was a communion rail. And we want to kneel down to receive our Lord. And um, and I've noticed, too, and now even like, for instance, SEEK, you know, the big focus conference uh, yeah. this is there, you know, kids will just drop to their knees, you know, without a community. Yeah. Um, so I think that that would be a huge thing. I think Ad Orientum would be huge. I think Roman Canon would be huge. Communion on the Tongue would be huge. I mean, those are things I think that would have a tremendous impact. But what you mentioned in there is probably the big those things, I think, would be really relatively easy. The big challenge, music. Yes. How do we restore music? And that is a challenge um, because um, music's a little more difficult than, you know, rearranging the architecture or, you know, these other kind of things. You've got to, um, you know, you, and I think it's absolutely necessary. I mentioned, you know, I was asked to be on the board of the Benedict XVI Institute. It's um, Archbishop Corleone in San Francisco and a few others, right. have said, you know, and, and that's their whole mission is to restore sacred music, among other things. Um, there's a lot of great things happening in the musical world, you know, and there's a lot of great um, uh, composers. That they're, they're, Adam Bartlett. Adam Bartlett has done wonderful things. I mean, he's probably one of the leaders. Um, and so we've got to restore music because um this banal music and like <laughs> you were saying you you ran into it just recently you thought i thought this thing was gone you know and my I, local I, parish mass of the immaculate conception december 8th we sang gentle woman <laughs> yeah i mean it's you know it's, oh i, mean, I almost set what little hair i have left on fire and the thing is you know um these old tired hymns that you know were not good when they were written in and they're not good now um you know are sort of easy thing and once they get into the memories and and you know and again you know my, my priests all of us you know we're not musical experts you know so we go with what we know and um it takes effort to teach people new music um 
But that we have to put energy into because music speaks to the soul. And uh, yeah. it's part of that whole experience of the transcendence. Again, you know, music leads us to silence. In fact, I'm not sure if this is true. I'm not a philologist, but um, our word uh, moot, which means silence, comes from music, you know, and that oh. the, the muses, the ancient muses, uh, the nine muses in the Greek world were the nine muses of the memory. And so music is something that is becomes a part of us. The, we, 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 it's the highest form. Only the lover sings, as Augustine says. So that's the highest praise we can do is to sing. We can't get in poetry. That, that brings in poetry because music is poetry. He who sings prays twice. It's he who sings prays twice. And what did St. Thomas Aquinas do at the end of his life? He composed hymns. Panis right? Angelicum. And all these great Eucharistic hymns. That he, you know, he he done everything he could do from the from the, the intellect. And, and how was, much great? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I interrupted. Finish no, your no, thought. I did, and then I was just going to conclude this. So he said, the, the best time, the best thing I can do with the rest of the, the life, the years I have, is to compose beautiful poetry and music for God. Amen. And it would, people forget about that about Aquinas. That at the he had the vision and said, you know. I, based on what I've seen, everything I've written is straw. Although our Lord reportedly said to him from the crucifix, you have written well of me, uh, yeah. Thomas. Uh, yeah. But uh, still, at the end of his life, after he had actually stopped writing, he started writing poetry and beautiful hymns and so on. And then, of course, the liturgy uh, in, the, in the heyday of, of, of classical music uh, was a great inspiration for some of the most beautiful, beautiful musical uh, liturgical things from Bach and Mozart for example it's oh. just incredible yeah it's and then not not to say that you know we go back to these concert masses at all you know but to, but just imagine no. those the inspiration of these great artists like Mozart and Beethoven Bach they were writing masses I mean they were doing yes songs and glorias and then you stay so you mentioned the Benedict the 16th Institute and they've done a mass of the ages yeah, no, massive, not mass of the America. mass of America. Yeah, mass, mass of the America. ages is the Tridentine liturgy, right. folks. Right, that's but, the film which too. is fine, fine by me. But mass of of Americas was put up by the Benedict the Sixteenth Institute. Right, right, right. And and so, you know, I think attention to music, really serious attention to music, it, it has to be part of the reform of the reform. And therefore, I would think that it should be a priority, if a parish is of a certain size and has the resources to have a well-trained choir. Right. Uh, one of the things in the Anglican liturgy, the ordinary liturgy that I attend is, we do have a full-time choir director. Paul Campbell is his name. Unbel he's a convert from Episcopalianism to Catholicism, just an unbelievable talent. And all of the members of our choir are volunteers. Most of them are kids from our homeschooling cooperative in the school and so on, in, in the church and so on. It's amazing what a full-time choir director can get out of even just volunteers and amateur choir. And I remember once I read something from C.S. Lewis years ago where he was defending the use of choirs at liturgy in place, not in place of, but as a supplement to congregational singing. And Lewis's point, and I experience this now at the ordinary because I can't sing a lick, is that if you have a great choir and it's singing beautifully, you then attach your own voice to that mm -hmm. in a way that elevates your voice mm -hmm. beyond. <laughs> I'm so yeah. pleased that I can add my voice to our choir because right. otherwise it's Songs hideous. Just like you'll sing too loud, you know. That's, uh, right. That's no, right. you're right. You're right. You're, you, it lifts you up. And if we're you, if you were just to kind of take your voice and separate it out from the choir, it probably wouldn't sound too good. But no. if if it was there with the choir, I mean, you're you're, you're doing pretty good. You're sounding pretty good, and you can you That's can right. hear yourself singing like I'm I'm right there with those people. I'm singing that high, that beautiful music. Yeah, and you it really does. Yeah, it is bad when it just becomes a choir and you're sitting back and I mean, a, a concert and you're sitting back and listening to this concert. But it isn't that my experience isn't that it is that. And then, of course, you can have a really gifted cantor if you can't afford a big choir, at least a very gifted cantor 
in the in the ordinary liturgy that we have a cantor that sings the 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 the, so the introit and all this kind of stuff right. as the priest is sensing the altar and that's another thing i would also include an increased so i'm, I'm advocating for choirs chant and an increased use of incense so right. what so now you can i'll shut up and you can comment on that no yeah it's true yes uh, yeah you can't hit like i think it was it, i think it was um Father Quinn said, "Molto mincensum, molto mincensum, molto mincensum, more incense. You can't have too much because it, you know, that not only does it it that it is that it, it engages the senses of smell. You've got that sweet odor coming up, but also then it fogs up the sanctuary, and so yeah. you know it's like a, like heaven up there. You can't quite see what's going on up there because it's this is." We're taking us, it's taking us to the heavenly realms because you've got this, you know, it's like in movies, they show what is heaven? It's cloudy, it's sort of like this, this, this you know. Oh yeah. It yeah. adds to the mysteriousness, the, the the cloud of unknowing. And yeah. of course, smoke rises. So it's rising from the altar, say, up into, you right. know, symbolically, it's up into heaven. And, I would add, and, I would add one more thing to that too. Um, music, we talked about incense, bells, smells, oh, yeah. bells, bells, bells. You know, bells are important, um, but also the uh, use of the, you mentioned the introit, the proper yeah. mass. In other words, those beautiful short little um, aspirations taken from the scripture that yeah. are placed in strategic places. Sometimes we skip those out altogether. The communion antiphon is is replaced by a hymn or something, or you just skip it altogether. The introit's never said, you know, those, the, those, that's integral parts of the mass which are tied to scripture that sometimes get lost and we don't we don't hear those yeah and i would also add uh i wouldn't mind moving the penitential right penitential prayer at the beginning to right before the reception of the eucharist and i say that now after after attending anglican ordinary liturgy there's an absolutely and i i recommend all my viewers and listeners to go look it up i'm sure it's online in in this ordinary at liturgy, right before we received communion, there's a prayer called the prayer of humble access. And it's, it's maybe nine or 10 sentences long. It's one of the most gorgeous, most beautiful prayers I have ever read in my entire life as, hmm. as a pen, as a penitential prayer. Hmm. Uh, it talks about being cleansed, you know, by the body and blood of Christ. And so on. it's just magnificent. Uh, and that really struck me as like, well, maybe that's a better place for the penitential prayers right before the reception of the Eucharist, rather than at the very beginning of mass. I don't know. That's just well, my know, thought. In the, in the ancient liturgy, the, you know, uh, the, the Latin mass, the 62 Missal, it's done both places. Yeah. It's at the beginning by the priest, and then it's done chanted right before Holy communion and for the people. Yeah. And, and there's another prayer in the Anglican ordinary liturgy right after communion prayer of thanksgiving that's also deeply penitential and but now in, in a post-receptive mode so anyway yeah these are all these are all aspects of what could be uh you know a reform of the reform and we do see we do see like benedict the 16th institute and of course we, you mentioned to me yesterday and i so i did a lot of research between yesterday and today on adam bartlett who's now in grand rapids michigan he's a musician and he has now developed a pew missile uh called uh, uh gosh um yeah what it was um, uh, um sound and sursum no what was it was it oh, yeah, so, uh, summit source and summit source Sarsen, and summit. yeah source and summit, yeah. summit yeah uh yeah and uh highly, highly recommend that yeah sure. and it's not simply a collection of chants and hymns uh but from what i get i mean it's got readings and and so on it's a real missile and but also it includes in there you know, pointers towards a whole digital platform that he has for training musicians, teaching Catholic musicians how to, uh, you know, really elevate the liturgy. It is just shocking to me. Yeah. And I know no, we're kind of running, shocking to me that we're still clinging to the St. Louis Jesuits. Right. No, let me just tie that up you know, at the end here. But Adam Bartlett's a, a good friend of mine. And uh, I think Adam agrees with this 100 percent that the and he knows that it, there has to be a liturgical element in the, in the new evangelization and he has devoted his whole life to trying 
to, to try to, to restore this sacred music. And he's using high technology with this app that he's created with all these chants to make it accessible to the people. He does workshops. He did a whole workshop for our priests here a few years ago. Um, so he's somebody to watch. Um, fairly young guy, uh, not so young anymore, but he's fairly young guy, younger than we are. Yeah, uh, younger than you and I. We're both 65, I think, or something. Like that. And he comes, at, it's interesting, Adam comes out of life teen, you know, the kind of, you know, which is not very liturgically um, yeah. dignified, you know, it's just, you know, kind of low, low church, you might say, um, very charismatic. Um, and he went from from that to, to a formal training in uh, composing and the history of music. And now he's sort of combined, because he, he knows, in fact, I think he was in Matt Marr's band for a while. And Matt Marr is a big, I don't know if you know, have heard of Matt Marr. Yeah. He's a, he's a great, he's a great musician, but I think that Adam was in his band for a while, but then he, he now is devoted himself to, you know, recovering the rich richness of our musical tradition. And, um, and he is a guy um, in source and summit to look to because he's really doing a lot. Yeah. And, and I think you see this propping, popping up here and there too, with other people doing other things. Uh, but that, as a wrap up here, and I'm going to throw a curveball at you since we didn't discuss this yesterday, but what, what would you say to those people, uh, Bishop Conway, who would, who are listening to this, who would adopt a sort of de gustibus non disputandum est mentality? Hey, there's no accounting for taste. And you guys are obviously high church and you have these very traditional, what some would say conservative liturgical tastes. Hey, but not everybody, you know, not, not everybody floats that way. Not everybody wants all this stuff. Uh, some people really, really like Gentlewoman and the St. Louis Jesuits and guitar masses and communion in the hand and more hippy dippy kind of liturgy. Uh, people like that. And uh, the, the beauty of the Novus Ordo in that modality is precisely its creativity and spontaneity and all these. So what would you say to those people who say, oh, that's all well for you guys. Go and do that. But leave the rest of us alone with your high flute and stuff. Well, that's a very good question, um, you know, because basically that's where most people are right now, I think. And that's where the resistance comes in. So go, that's why I exactly. raised the question. Exactly. That's where the resistance comes in. I think you just need to show them because I know I've talked to people who, you know, say like, what's the big deal? Why, you know, why are you so? And, and, and once they have this experience, and this is really the key, and we talked about this, we started with this, so it's a good way to end with this. Once they've really had um, more than just a feel good uh, experience at mass, you know, and, and singing, you know, these, these, these contemporary hymns can make you feel good and happy inside and all that kind of thing. Okay, fine. But once you've really experienced the holy, you know, the transcendent God who's really moved you to tears, I mean, it moved your heart to conversion which you can experience in, 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 a, in a liturgy, a, a beautiful high liturgy. Um, I think that's where we have to bring people and we have to show them that. Not drastically, I mean, you've got to lead them to that, but I think that's the pinnacle. I mean, do you want to settle for just feeling good or do you want to, do you want to feel God? You know, do you want to really experience exactly. the holy, to take you out of this world, which is really what the liturgy is supposed to do. The cause we are yes. with angels and saints in heaven. I mean, do you feel exactly. like you just came came down from heaven, or did you just come back from having a good time? And so there are liturgical aesthetic principles involved here that allow us to say, no, this isn't just one person's personal taste above others. There is a form of liturgical music, and we talked about this on the phone yesterday, that is simply sentimentalist, that makes you feel good or makes you, you know, like gentle woman. Oh, that reminds me of my mommy when she made me sandwiches when I was sick, when I was six years old. And Mary was just like, OK, there's a point to that. OK, fine. But it's sentimentalist, whereas proper liturgical music, as you just said, should lead to conversion, should cause you to lift up higher, should cause you to be doxological, that you are not just getting all emotional over a schmutzy song about Mary reminding you of your own mother, but that it's, it's raising you up. It's what, so what I would say is that just as with great art, all right, mm -hmm. it's not proper liturgical music. If it never moves you to almost tears, 
Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, now, sentimentalist music can do that, too. But but tears that emerge out of deep, deep spiritual joy, that that's a different kind of tear. And it and, and energizes you to want to change your life and be a saint, to do heroic things. Yes. If you come out of this, you know, I want I'm 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 I'm, I'm going to I'm going to change my life. You know, I, I'm going to really I'm going to follow Jesus in a more radical way. That's right. That's right. And I, let, let's let's end with that, that the liturgy <laughs> wait, should wait. lead us to follow Jesus in a more radical way. I almost feel like we need a part two to this conversation to really keep it going. I'm up I, for that sometime. OK, well, yeah, you're busy. I'm busy. Uh, and, and we have new dairy goats on the farm. We're doing, we're in the middle of a fundraiser for that right now. But anyway, by the way, my, my, my bees survived this last frigid, uh, sub wow. at least one hive has one hive is alive. Well, we, had a, the, we had a 60 degree day yesterday and I saw the bees flying around. So, so my, I, uh, I lost one hive. Viewers know that Lincoln, Nebraska, like much of the upper mid, uh, the upper Midwest, the great plains suffered through like 20 below zero actual temperatures Fahrenheit with wind chills of 40 and 50 below. We had a taste of that here in Pennsylvania, but nothing like that. My sister has horses in eastern Nebraska. She was very worried about them. Uh, and the, your bee achievement is, is as I, we used to keep bees on the Dorothy Day Catholic Worker Farm here. But I discovered one thing, really, the one thing that bees do really well is die. <laughs> and it was becoming a very expensive hobby, replacing the bees. So kudos to you for keeping your bees alive. Oh, well. At least, at least one hive. At least one hive. Well, I would like to thank His Excellency Bishop James Connolly of Lincoln, Nebraska, for joining me today, or as I refer to him as simply Jim, my old friend. It's just hard for me to. His Excellency, the Bishop of Lincoln. You know, to me, you're that little skinny, be, be the <laughs> round John Lennon glasses showing up fresh from the organic farm. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, thanks, thanks for being on here today. Thank you, Larry. Always All right, nice. and th- thanks to everybody for listening. Uh, bye now.